Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. Uh, new spring dew and everything. It's time to get a little bit warmer out there. The first farmer's market is in the books, and we're going to be continuing doing all that kind of stuff and more. I have a very thick city council uh, um, and with committee meetings and more for your morning. And Sunday uh, was uh, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples Day with the city making a proclamation Monday. Municipal clerks got one of those for the entire week of this week. Uh, two New Zealands got recognized for 60 years of residency and public acti uh, activism for Ron and Nancy Erickson for the date of May 12th, which is this Sunday. Uh, the University of Montana has proposed to construct a new residence hall. Many of the residence halls are old, and they're looking to get a new residence hall and then effectively tear down a couple of the older ones. Uh, this is something that uh, in Missoula and continues many of the projects the university has done in the past, but this one is geared towards the students to live on campus. It really does seem like every five years there's a new building uh, being proposed and popping up at the University of Montana. But we have, uh, so far, we have one all-female hall, one all-male hall, six co-ed halls available for the students. They also have uh, several uh, living learning communities for students within residence halls. Uh, this one is proposed for more of an apartment type living in the southeast corner of campus. So Claire Loveless, uh, Community Planning Development and Innovation, talks a little bit more about this program with a map and all. There is a concentration of residential uses surrounding the University of Montana. The surrounding uses of the university are compatible with the land use designation outlined in the growth policy. The OP3 zoning district is a current relatable district in the public and quasi-public land use designation. And the R5.4 zoning district is a current relatable district in the residential medium land use des designation. And if you take a closer look as I, we zoom in here, that star is essentially located at the very south end corner. There's that street light that goes there, and there's just a lot here of... Here are some renderings. Hold of on a second. Uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of great opportunities for development on this land. It is a clear clearing. Um, there's like one basketball court there, but it's not going to be too much in the way for this process as they're moving forward. And as you saw from the uh, Kinsburn effect, uh, it's mostly grass and Missoula is growing. It only makes sense for the university update for that growth. And here is what the building would look like in rendering as you saw a little tease. Uh, and here she is talking a little bit more about this. Here are some renderings of the proposed development. Uh, the proposed residence hall will be 600 beds. The proposed building is approximately 77 feet tall. The maximum height for buildings in OP3 districts is 100 feet. Okay. And so, as you can see, most likely it might end up being the picture down below, very similar to what they did with the Rome building, which is off-campus living right next to the Missoula Public Library. Yeah, there's a lot definitely going on here as well. Um, uh, Don MacArthur with the MMW Architects for the University talks about this project, and this is what he had to say about this. You know, a couple things that I would say about the project that are maybe not obvious from the presentation, but as we as we um, think about modernizing um, the dorms, uh, rooms on campus, part of it is to recognize that things are changing in our environment and um, there's a need for cooling and um, control of smoke and other things that has not been, uh, you know, the history of Missoula. So this is part of the modernization. The other part is just to think about how are we attracting students to the campus and making sure that um, we're really selling a story of great place it is to live and great place to go to school. All right, and so, and so far many of the buildings on campus are at least 60 years old and modernizing is key. Most buildings built have been to supply many. Uh, Jamil uh, Chadani, the project lead, talks about the building they plan to tear down after the fact. Uh, we have about 1,850 beds on campus currently, and the 600 new beds that we're planning on adding um, are brand new beds, but it's anticipation of the uh, future demolition of Craig Dunway and Elrod, which are, as Don said, really old. Elrod by itself is about 100 years old um, and not getting any younger like I am. Um, so we're trying to modernize and stay up to date with our competition and uh, do what's right for incoming freshman students. And if you are a student of the university or, or lived in the dorm setting, you know for a fact that a lot of these buildings were not well taken care of. 
uh, and by the time this is completed uh, in construction in fall of 2027, those two residencies, Craig Dunaway and Elrod, will be closed and uh, queued for demolition. The need for housing is low and incoming freshmen will not be impacted by the needs of the university. Um, as we move on, in terms of parking, the university will lose over 200 spots and have an entirely new presentation next week to address those issues. In the news recently, the city of Missoula is looking to get more funding through grants related to infrastructure improvements uh, related to Russell Street to meet the needs of traffic and mixing heavy vehicles with the needed infrastructure and safety requirements of the area because Russell also uh, correlates with the uh, the fairgrounds and the uh, YMCA and also the Russell uh, Elementary School. Aaron Wilson with transportation and planning for the city of Missoula talks a little bit more about this. Financial benefit of receiving these grant funds. We're finding Russell Street is, you know, an expensive project. It costs a lot of money to do roadway reconstructions. And so what, it, the, what we're finding is that it's just tying up our federal funds for a really long time to try to get this project delivered. And so every year it delays, it gets more expensive. We have to have more funding to find to fill the gaps. And so we're kind of just in this endless cycle of trying to find the funding to get the project done. Um, and it, it just ties up our federal discretionary or federal formula funds that we get to program through the MPO. So if we get grant funding, it frees up those other um, state programmed funds and the MPO programmed funds that we could pro use towards other projects that may be smaller or um, local priorities. Um, and there's a whole list of those from the long range plan and our um, ongoing um, CIP for the city. So essentially these federal funds allow us to have more flexibility in how we program our, our locally allocated federal funding. And just to give a little bit of retrospect for the Russell uh, uh, Street, um, 2015 of October, I remember very vividly because I filmed it over when, um, uh, when the Missoula Food Co-op still existed. Um, they um, essentially had plans, had developments, had everything all squared away in 2015, but they weren't, uh, and this is just for the, uh, the bridge project. I mean, the bridge project is already pretty uh, massive on its own, but it was such an ongoing thing and it took forever just for them to get to the point where they could actually create the plans in 2015 in which they finally completed, completed it in 2019, 2020, just in time for the pandemic to uh, take into full effect at that time. And so uh, in English, those grants on grants will open the doors for projects that the city can tap after the fact rather than making proposals for every dollar. Uh, Aaron talks about the safety for Russell between red tape for heavy industri uh, industrial vehicles with safety of bike ped along the road. Uh, Danny Carlino is worried about the congestion of this particular area as it's becoming more and more developed with uh, wider lanes. Um, I think we don't need to consent as a city to, to MDT's plans. I understand that MDT's design plans probably won over what the city would ideally do, but I, I don't think we should consent to making a, a giant five lane road like this through our town. It's very dangerous. All right. And this is what he had to say about that. Aaron Wilson um, uh, responds to Danny Carlino's concerns. I think there are ways you can design a five lane road so that it is not dangerous for the people who are using it. Um, and we even see that in the, the section that has already been completed. We saw a reduction of crashes. Um, so pre-construction and we only have about two years post-construction to look at, um, but we've seen a, a decrease in the number of crashes on that section. So it is, um, appearing to be safe, hopefully that, that trend continues, but um, there, safety should always be our highest priority and that is how we as the city would approach this project in working with, with MDT as a partner. Yep. And so there's a lot of things happening for sure and you know, uh, you know, Russell Street wasn't always like the major corridor for the most part and a lot of people ended up using it just because there is a bridge when because once you install a bridge the the road basically kind of kind of becomes a main road for a lot of people trying to get through to the other side of town um, that was just one of the things uh, with that and so now the multimodal uh, federal grant application is up to the federal government to help fund this mechanism with the montana department of transportation since you know most grants are uh, deadline based uh, most of the history of the parts of russell are pretty touch and go with lanes expanding and shrinking at various points and aaron wilson when he was talking about the segment uh, uh, in question about how when they added those extra lanes um, they uh, for, and the safety was a lot more um, um, addressed in those areas, especially from when you're going to 
just off the bridge, off Russell Bridge, as you go into those wide lanes before you hit the uh, third street and then it goes into single lanes for a while and then it starts growing a little bit wider as you uh, approach Mount Street. And you know, it, it kind of ebbs and flows for quite a bit. It works fine, but it's uh, not a feasible solution moving into the future as they're looking to try to mitigate more traffic as you know, trucks and bigger vehicles are coming off the highway, especially uh, down Russell if you go past Broadway. All right, so, you know, if you're not from Missoula, you know, then you don't really know what I'm talking about for the most part, but this is kind of like one of those things that are just like, it's just cuts right through the center of Mis the city of Missoula, not to count the downtown area, which used to be the center of Missoula, and now it's kind of like more of like eastern downtown Missoula. Uh, climate, conservation, and parks. And so we're going to jump into some of, the, some of the Wednesday community meetings. Talks about the 2019 Missoula County and the city of Missoula's goal of 100% clean energy uh, for the Missoula urban area by 2030. And so they're working with the city of Bozeman and lo looking into creating what's called green tariffs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And uh, Avora Glen Community Development goes into more detail about this proposal and where they are currently. Fresher. The Green Power Program's goal is to ensure that Northwestern Energy customers in Montana can subscribe to new renewable energy from uh, a new renewable energy project developed in the state. We began work uh, collaboratively with Missoula County and the City of Bozeman on this effort in 2021. We've recently struck an exciting milestone. We were able to approve through a joint public hearing in December our term sheet for the Green Power Program. That term sheet uh, provides an overview of the program design, including details around how we will proceed through implementation and overall roles and responsibilities in broad strokes. All right, and so that was a very uh, um, Glenn on that one. It has been an uphill battle since the power company vowed to work with the community on one side, but investing in coal in eastern Montana. In terms of vitamins build back better, Montana also has many green initiatives you can also take full advantage of in terms of tax breaks to projects that can be funded in part or in full. Uh, and speaking of funding, I also asked a question by City Council Member Bob Campbell about the partnership with North Northwestern and about $40,000 uh, for this continued partnership and funding this thing, and this is what she had to say. This will be the first green tariff or green power program that would be established in Montana. We do know that there have been numerous programs across the rest of the country. Um, so there's ample precedent for this type of program. As to the Public Service Commission's perspective, uh, this, these three communities, the Missoula County, City of Missoula, and City of Bozeman, have not had conversations with Public Service Commission um, commissioners at this point around their perspective on the agreement. We will be engaging with them as we approach filing with the Public Service Commission to ensure, of course, that they are familiar and that especially that Public Service Commission staff are familiar with the goals of this program. And, you know, just, think, just thinking back even 10 years ago, there's a lot of people who are uh, decrying that, you know, solar is the future, solar is everything. And it just felt as though that it was kind of going nowhere because most of the argument against it was the uh, holding on to the power supply even after generating the power supply because you can't expect to have sunshine uh, eight months during the winter time um, and like heavy clouds and everything like that. And so the storage of energy is not the same thing because with a lot of the power companies, it's they try to generate power through consistent power generation and um, distribution rather than uh, holding on to some of that power. And, you know, um, let's see, to do, do, do green tariffs and, you know, have also been floated around since the city went into this phase and would have a written obligation for utilities to honor green power sources in part or in full uh, for electricity in the future. And so right now it's just one of those updates moving forward and they are happy about uh, how things are going. And we're going to jump right into housing community planning and they're talking about a place called home and the Spring Homeless Program, but we're gonna jump right into the Rivara Project where Emily Harris Shears, Community Development, will be wrapping up her time with the uh, city of Missoula as the Rivara Project starts uh, breaking ground in construction. 
Um, this project is really exciting. It helps us meet our goals around learning about, um, you know, like unified development process for a, a main community or main neighborhood strategy, which is aimed in a place to call home. But more than that, it creates 89 homes for people in our community. And it really reflects the soul of this neighborhood because it wouldn't have been possible without the community's uh, activism and engagement around the use of that land after um, DEQ's assessment of it. Yep, and there were a lot of naysayers about the city owning property, but because of them acquiring and purchasing these acreage of land up in the north side Scott Street project, they were able to create this new program with a public-private partnership with the Rivara project to create this uh, affordable housing incentive in which it would be a, well, from what I've described it as a lease to own home. So you pay for the house, the city owns the land and stewards the land, and then you eventually pay for it. And so um, this is, uh, you know, land acquisition flexibility are often at odds at many neighborhoods in the city of Missoula. And this is one of those projects that are uh, taking old industrial sites. Um, they did all their testing, did all their stuff, and through the Department of Environmental Quality, were able to assess that they were able to develop this and rezone it for residential use. So uh, the other Emily, Emily Armstrong, uh, talked about funding and talked a little bit more about the house list pro program update. And so they do this one every quarterly. And as we get closer and closer towards the uh, fall, uh, in which the affordable, uh, uh, the American, how, uh, the American um, Rescue Plan uh, fund that went to this program will be sunsetting by the fall of this year. And so Emily Harris, uh, talk, Emily, Emily, Emily Armstrong with the uh, uh, Homeless um, Project talks a little bit more about the Johnson Street Temporary Shelter and their funding. Um, the, the purpose of this contract is to have the Pavarello Center provide emergency shelter services at the Johnson Street Shelter Facility, which includes activities related to new and ongoing programming to provide additional emergency sheltering services. Um, this contract is August of 23 through September of 24. And the amount is not to exceed $789,345. The funding source for this contract was the American Rescue Plan Act. We used some of the dollars that the city had from that um, federal funding. And uh, the county also contributed funding towards this project. And there is not currently any identified continued funding for the shelter beyond its current contract. But that's not going to stop Missoula as they are working to... Uh curb a lot of this stuff in terms of houselessness. Um, and then we uh, refer back over to the chief of police, Mike Collier, who uh, talks about their presence in this particular, in the, in the, in the area uh, during this last year. Highest uh, frequency of types of things we were seeing during that 104 calls was um, a dozen suspicious activities, nine of them were traffic sp stops, and the other, the other seven were just officer advice type calls. So uh, fairly benign type calls. When it opened up, uh, our calls for service went up to 352. Uh, 43 of those were, were traffic stops. Uh, the other high frequency calls that we recognized then were theft, persons to be removed, and uh, persons needing of assistance. And then the most recent quarter, December through March, the, the calls for service are up again, up to 422. 57 of those calls for service uh, were for some type of a theft. 32 were a suspicious activity and 26 for persons to be removed. So um, the directed patrol numbers, you'll see in the first quarter that they were open were pretty high, 803. I asked people to really make a concerted effort to be there during the initial opening of that just to get this thing off to a good start in the neighborhood. Uh, the direct patrols are down 300 to 306. Uh, I don't really know what to attribute that out to other than maybe other demands elsewhere and just the number of calls for service in that area already, I think waned a little bit on their ability to get in for, uh, you know, direct patrols on top of that. All right. So as it turned out is that they uh, upped the police presence there and then determined later on that it wasn't as necessary. Mike also mentioned that theft was a result of those staying in and around the shelter and not those who were housed as even here in the library, some of the drama spilled over here with some of the folks pointing their fingers. So homeless folks do call the police too. 
Uh, Built for Zero is a part of their master plan, so we're moving forward, uh, which they plan to roll out in fall as the shelter's funding sunsets uh, the, from the pandemic. So as we delve into the future on the site, Emily Armstrong talks about what's next for uh, Missoula as funding wraps. Specifics of this contract, just to outline, um, it's with Homebase, as I've shared, to create Missoula's next community strategy to address houselessness. Uh, our best estimate to on timeline is the full calendar year of 2024, um, although we are willing to be flexible and adaptive depending on how the project unfolds. And the contract amount, which was passed in the last fiscal year, fiscal 24, is not to exceed $70,000. Um, and there's a website if people want to engage, learn more. Um, we hosted some community events in April, and there's a bunch of materials from those on the website, um, some really interesting voting results. So I would just encourage folks to check out the website. Um, there's an option on the website to share your own ideas or suggestions, and we'd love to hear from community members with any of that information as well. All right. And so that will wrap up my uh, presentation for, for my city council report. It is an interesting time we're living in because local wages are not keeping up with the inflationary values of rent to a point where houselessness isn't just a problem, but for the folks who are houseless, but for folks getting closer to their own homeless story grows. But the city cannot dictate trends in pricing, let alone influence affordability through policy alone. It takes effort through incentivized community programs like Home Base, uh, Pavarella, United Way of Missoula Centralized Housing Solution, and many other organizations trying to exceed meeting people halfway. So for more information, you can go to engagemissoula.com, like she mentioned, or you, as always, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us. Up next, we have one of those fun little videos from our Spring Flicks camp, and this one is, you know, a killer's just having a hard time killing. So without further ado, here is uh, Ghostface in a short video by one of our kids of our spring break camp that we did last spring. Hello. Do you want to play a game? What? What? Fortnite? That's not the game I'm talking about. I don't even play games like that. I'm talking about a trivia question game. I don't know. Just listen up. Is this a trivia about St. Patrick's Day? This trivia isn't about St. Patrick's Day. Please just listen. First question. How many stab movies are there? Six. I'm sorry, but that's not right. Now I'm going to have to... He's crazy. Hey, weren't you just alone all the call with me? Allergic to Legos. Lives? Do you have extra lives? Well, I mean, I'm a skeleton.
Okay. with attitude. Meow, 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 meow. talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. It's time for pre-critic or a pre-judged movie based on absolutely nothing. We're kicking things off with Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, which is a brand new uh, original trilogy based on the movies that uh, from War, Dawn, and Rise. Uh, not necessarily in that order, but smart humans mean danger for the Planet of the Apes as we dive into a new adventure with a brand new cast of talking apes. Uh, from the perspective of Caesar's legacy, and Caesar is the, like, he's like the main monkey from the previous movies. Anyways, uh, let's follow a plucky ape guy as he just kind of chills with his tribe only to be introduced to a more organized community that has religion, hierarchy, and plenty of laughs from a perspective of seeing this culture blossom. Enjoy a series of cat and mouse and overthrowing the government in a world of the planet of the apes. Um, then we have not another church movie. Have you ever uh, seen those movies where it's just like, Oh, great. Uh, you've seen a lot of those movies, but actually this is like one of those movies that are making fun of Tyler Perry movies. So we haven't seen these kind of movies in a while, and not necessarily the church ones, but those films uh, that make fun of all those kind of films. But when you try to do an off-the-wall comedy, you kind of have to incorporate actors for God and the Devil with little magic from a Medea type that uh, max the Lord into children and childish adults. So we have a guy who is literally playing Tyler Perry, but it's spelled differently. It's about, and it's uh, with a silent P, so it's Tyler Harry, a type of looking film about uh, this Jesus and such. This is one more uh, about God asks uh, fake Tyler P, and the devil interferes with hilarious results and more. So that's kind of what that's all about. And this one is like, I thought this was like, uh, okay, so this movie is called The Image of You, and so has evil twins, boom need to say more but the whole idea of this is a thriller where a guy wall street guy starts dating this girl and uh basically it's a wall street guy from the 90s because nowadays it's mostly about a bitcoin bros who rather get rich quicker and lose out instantly enjoy your typical 90s sexual thriller about twins as one of the girls falls in loves while the other one works hard undercover to undercover the truth about her beau um and but thoughts of jealousy force the drama to a dramatic conclusion of conspiracy is always right because Hollywood movies would never leave this open-ended like things they got to tie up or at least a tense sequel to a movie that's probably should have been on, on Lifetime. Anyways, those are the movies that are coming out this weekend and up next we have a, 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 a dub and stuff from uh, the 1955 film starring Jack Palance uh, called Big Knife. Hold on a second, let me just all right, all right, smile for the camera, smile for the camera. You're smiling for the camera. $500 for the smile at the good camera. All right, we are done. Uh, good job, Jack. I'm really proud of you. Always like receiving compliments from my yes men. Uh, I got to say that your pro tennis angle is really working out just fine for you, and I think a lot of people are going to register very well with this campaign. Well, when you're trying to manipulate the masses, you just need plenty of hype men. Oh, and yes, men to boot. Well, next up, candy cigarettes. Well, the sooner we can get kids hooked on candy, the better. Well, the guys in R&R &R are really excited about this campaign and hope he can be part of it. Well, let's drink to it. Here you go. I'll be as rich as Gandhi after this. Uh, well, you know that Gandhi gave up material wealth, right? In fact, he doesn't even buy his own clothes. He makes it himself. Didn't you want peace? You know, piece of the pie? Uh, no. That's not what it was. Oh, then what are we doing here? 
Uh, well, let's just change the subject. How are things with the missus, by the way? Is she doing okay? You know, our wives have been talking, and she, my wife told me that your wife is, uh, you know, doing some stuff lately, and it has a lot to do with your um, addiction to... Listen, I like short shorts just like as much as the next guy. I want to accessorize. Well, you know, the thing is, is that mm. she could clean your shorts for mm. you and you can wear them again, but it seems like you just Ugh. buy new ones and then you don't even throw them mm -hmm. out. It's becoming a real problem. And she's mm. just really worried. I, my wife is just wondering right. why your wife isn't, you know, just uh, yeah, yeah, trying to convince you to clean up your shorts and everything like that and just using them again. It feels like it's such a waste, kind of like... You know, paper towels, and, but, you know, sometimes people just use towels instead, where they can just reuse them. But you just seem to be kind of be using this as wasteful. Listen, I have more than enough money than I'll ever need, and why not waste it? You know, I told my wife I would throw those things out when I got the chance, and, you know, I just want to keep them. You know, there might come a day where I might want to reuse those shorts. Don't you understand me? Well, I do work for you, so I do have to agree with you. Hmm. <clears throat> Uh, do you think that I went a little bit too far in some places? Uh, 50 50. Well, that's all I want to say about that. Thanks for your input, but uh, don't let me dictate how you live your life, okay? I'll see you later. talking about some things that are happening this weekend it is time for your events and hey if you're interested in learning some pickleball now is the time to do it because lifelong learning center is introducing their uh, beginning pickleball this morning starting like right now but they usually have these ongoing throughout the summer uh, they are also be doing intermediate pickleball at 9 30 and then there another immediate one at 11 a.m. and this is through the lifelong learning center one of the fastest growing and low, lower effort sports this is a popular class in missoula provided by the lifelong learning center they also have a uh, yoga for healthy aging this is part of the cancer support group for the uh, learning center at red, red willow uh, it starts at 9 a.m. Um, we also have a market that's going on this weekend friday and saturday from 9 to 2 p.m. <laughs> missoula's best spring sale at the holy spirit escapole church sorry but uh, it's going to be a spring market. It's the best prices, clothing, vintage slash name brands, uh, outdoor items, uh, books, jewelry, houseware, linens, craft supplies, small furniture, collectibles of all sorts. Well, just about everything. Uh, family fun time at Ms. Mojo Nacho starting at 10 a.m. Uh, we also have Missoula Food Bank meal distribution open hours starting at 10 a.m. to about 1 p.m. today for folks who are looking to get some uh, cheap, nutritious food for the community through the food bank. Mother's Day tea. The Missoula Fairgrounds is hosting a tea party from about 10 to 4 p.m. This is a uh, Mountain Homes annual fundraiser. It's a tea party in celebration of the joys and challenges of motherhood. Learn about Mountain Homes holistic and two-generational wraparound service and the plans to grow the work to better serve families across the community. Butterfly release and the Butterfly House opens at 10 a.m. and they also have a butterfly release every uh, day at around 10.30 a.m. to welcome new butterflies into the area. And if you haven't been there, it's every two weeks. There's a whole bunch of new uh, broods of butterflies that are always there. They do not live that long because a lot of times they uh, become butterflies just so they have the uh, opportunity to breed more. Tiny Tales is happening here at the Missoula Public Library at 10.30 a.m. and it is a great opportunity for kids to learn reading here at the Missoula Public Library. Lunch at the Missoula Senior Center. This happens every weekday, Monday through Friday at 11.30 a.m. This is through the Missoula Senior Center. The Pavarella Center also has lunches uh, daily, not just on uh, the weekdays, but they have it at 11.30 a.m. They also have breakfast at early in the morning. Not to mention they do some dinners, uh, they do a lot of dinners throughout the week for people who are struggling with houselessness and need some uh, free food. Uh, yarns at Missoula Public Library, this is a great opportunity for people to get a go up on the fourth floor, work on their arts and crafts projects, uh, whether that be knitting or watercolor, which is happening at the Cooper Room and the Blackboard Board Meeting Room on the fourth floor. Lego Club and After School Meals in the Imaginarium here at the Public Library at 2.30 p.m. Um, Upcycle is um, to, uh, teaching people to use their own tote bag. All instruction and some materials are uh, uh, materials for informative, enriching, creative experiences are provided through the request that you bring your own textiles, t-shirts, fabrics, scraps, and other materials to help you upcycle your tote bag. So this whole uh, through this is upcycle Missoula and 
part of this is to create your own tote bag through old materials and more, and this is going to be at the Missoula Public Library. Young Adults, young adults Writers Group, this is ongoing as well. This is a great opportunity for young adults to uh, better improve their writing. Uh, Predator Feedy at the Butterfly House at 3.30 p.m. on uh, most days at the Butterfly House as well. Um, Willard Art Show, this is uh, the Willard Alternative High School, and so their, their students are doing a collective of art that spanned for over 20 years, um, and they're gonna be hosting this starting at 5.30 p.m. tonight. The Pesky Varmints, live at the Ten Spoon Winery. They're gonna be uh, doing a lot of bands and a lot of things happening at Ten Spoon Winery as the weather gets a little bit warm outside, and they're gonna be hosted at Multigeron and Music starting at 6 p.m. Uh, Mike Johnson, is going to do some multi-genre music happening at, um, oh darn, where was that at? Um, let me just refer to my musical events. Just give me a second, I'll find it real quick. It's so weird, I wonder what happened to that, but uh, regardless, um, his thing is happening tonight at 6 p.m. Mike Johnson. I believe that's probably Imagination Brewing Company. It usually is around that time. Um, yep, Imagination Brewing Company. We also have a Missoula Folklore Society English con Country Dance. This uh, Elks Lodge, they've been doing this pretty much ongoing. Night Blooming Jasmine at the Old Post is gonna be featuring some jazz well, uh, some jazz there. And uh, uh, speaking of well, Shake Well and is with uh, Desperate Electric at the Wilma Theater is gonna be playing some funk and rock music at the Wilma starting at 7 p.m. tonight. Uh, we also have Disney's Beauty and the Beast wrapping up their MCT, MCT show this weekend. Uh, Beauty and the Beast uh, is a uh, well-known show, musical, performed at the Missoula Community Theater. It's one of their last shows as they're wrapping up for the summer season of all their kids and Missoula Children's Theater going into full gear throughout the summer. Miss Cass Production presents Ordinary Days. This is through Westside Theater. This is happening all weekend long as well. The, uh, a Dog Confessor. Uh, uh, a new play by Joan Carroll Melcher is going to be happening at the Zootown Arts Community Center uh, this weekend. So we have a lot of theater happening this weekend as well. Justin Harris is going to be playing some rock country music at Cranky Stan Public House. Red Devil's Boogie Auntie E is going to be at Monk's Bar tonight playing electronic music starting at 9, 9 p.m. And Joan Zenit um, is going to be at the Union Club at 9 p.m. with Borrow Six playing a two-night show at the uh, Sunrise Saloon uh, Friday and Saturday at 9 p.m. And so as we get further and further down into the weekend, we also have the uh, farmer's market in full swing, started around 8 a.m. to about 1 p.m. most uh, Saturdays, well until the end of October. If you're interested in that, it's ongoing, it'll be downtown, you can't miss it. Women-led carpentry workshop, a visual urban demonstration project is doing some carpentry workshops on at 10 a.m. on Saturday. Drawing, outdoor, drawing Outdoors Lifelong Learning Center is doing a class at 10 a.m. for Drawing Outdoors. They're also doing a Fat Girls Hiking. They're doing the Lincoln Hills Hike, which is the, they're gonna meet at uh, Mount Jumbo, the, uh, the entry to the L, and they'll uh, go up there. The single dirt track rail, dirt uh, trail. They'll also hike steady incline, taking breaks along the way, and then they'll loop back. Story time at the Missoula Public Library. They moved it from Fridays to uh, Saturdays, so you guys could enjoy that every Saturday at 10.30 a.m. at the Missoula Public Library. They also is, are hosting here at the Public Library on Saturday is the uh, chess tournament at Missoula Public Library, and you can join the Missoula Chess Tournament for their annual spring tournament, this free event for kids grades second through uh, 12th grade. Mizzou museum tour and free multi-aging workshop, Critical Eye, Missoula Art Museum is hosting um, Bev Glukert in a workshop focused on the exhibition Critical Eye, selections from Kim and Ruth Rickening collection, and it's gonna be on view through May 11th. Tour the exhibit, then make art. Um, Moon Randolph Homestead, so one of the homesteads is, that is owned and operated through the city of Missoula, is open this summer, and it starts at 11 a.m. They have regular open hours. They usually do a bunch of events, tours of the grounds, and everything like that. Mama's Day Flowering Bowl at Radius Gallery, so make your own one or buy one for your mom for Sunday, because it is Mother's Day this Sunday. Teen Open Studio at the Missoula Museum at 12.30 p.m. They provide art supplies. They have some snacks for teens to encourage them to do more art at the Missoula Art Museum. Speaking of encouraging kids, Missoula MCATs here at MCAT Studios. We're going to have a Saturday drop-in. We'll be wrapping up towards the at the end of May uh, for our summer camps. It starts at 1 p.m. every Saturday until the end of May. Saturday Kids Activity, Mount St. Helens. So this is the through the uh, um, Natural History Center in the uh, just off of McCormick 
Road uh, as you're going down um, Wyoming Street. And so they're doing a thing on Mount St. Helens and they're specifically, but there's more to it than just that. They have museum and more uh, talking about the Natural History Museum. So uh, make a multi-stranded beaded necklace at Bathing Beauties at 1 p.m. Uh, Predator feeding at the Butterfly House at 3.30 p.m. John Floridus is going to be at Ten Spoon Winery at 6 p.m. on Saturday night. Natalis is going to be playing some jazz music at Imagination Brewing Company at 6 p.m. Bingo Night at Odd Pitch Brewing Company at 6 p.m. Live comedy at the VFW. They also do one on Sundays at 8 p.m. They also have dueling pianos with Josh Farmer and Kyle Curtis at Stave & Hoop. Uh, solid State Karaoke in the uh, West Side Lanes and Fun Center at 9 p.m. Jack uh, Cash for Junkers at Union Club. Uh, 406, they're doing the round two at the Sunrise Saloon. And they're also doing a Latin night jazz, uh, Latin night uh, salsa slash dance at Dark Horse Bar, which is right next to the, um, the, uh, the Sunrise Saloon. Uh, DJ Chris Moon, every Saturday at 10 p.m. at the Badlander. They also have a Mother's Day brunch with John Floridus at the Old Post starting at 10 a.m. on Sunday. Uh, Payne Savvy Walk and Talk, uh, Missoula Family YMCA, whether you are in person or with pain, care about someone living with pain or just curious, the Family YMCA is hosting this every second and fourth Sunday at 11 a.m. They also have a Five Valley Accordion Club dance slash jam. Uh, bring your accordion or just jam out to accordion music at the Musical Senior Center at 1 p.m. on Sunday. So that's pretty much it for what's happening here in the city of Missoula this weekend. Uh, if you're interested in doing some late night events on, on Sunday, Imagination Brew Company is hosting 10 Cent Mule Bluegrass Music, Tom Catmull with Draft Works Brewing Company, Dolce Cando is uh, doing Refuge at St. Uh, Anthony Parish. It's going to be some choral music at 7 p.m. Very funny weekend comedy mic at VFW and some karaoke at the Sunrise Saloon um, for Sunday as well. So as you might have known, there's are some news items happening here in the city of Missoula. MCPS was looking to, for additional funding for the 2024-2025 fiscal year, and it looked like the general fund got a boost by local taxpayers. And through the election that happened on, on Tuesday, that being said, property taxes have been the only reliable means of getting tax revenue for our community as industry, which once grew communities left and, uh, and began closing and outsourcing resources to an ever-growing global economy with the local industry could not keep up with. So the general fund levy for the elementary school was valued at $105,000. And the cost for $100,000 assessed value would be 90 cent, 90, uh, 79 cents per year. And the high school levy was at 403000 which increased by $1.65 per 100000 So I did the math for you guys, and overall the medium house price for Missoula is $539,000, according to the Realtors.com, which makes the levy at roughly $13 a year per home. And overall, this would add $3.6 million deficit uh, that would add to the $3.6 million deficit that resulted in cutting many jobs that the schools will go on to fight another day. Uh, another levy for uh, uh, schools was a safety levy for schools for a total of $1.6 million was proposed, which is geared towards improved campus security systems and facilities, technology upgrades, uh, preventative service for nurses, school resource officers, you know, police residents in schools, school counselors and behavioral interventionists, so it's just preventative care for kids who are struggling. Uh, the, elementary one, the elementary one did pass, but the high school one failed barely. In Missoula, for those items based on $11 for elementary schools, uh, $59 increase per year for the average home valued in Missoula. So overall, you're looking at roughly, um, let's see, I did the math real quick, 13 plus 59, and so roughly you're going to be uh, looking at about $72 extra per year on your taxes just in that vein. Missoula has tended to support schools and after facing cuts in music programs this past year, galvanized citizens into action. And we have some polling results courtesy of KPAX News. And we are actually going to take a quick look at some of their results as we throw it over to their uh, link of their election results. And so as you saw here, we'll just zoom in a little bit more. The, MC, the general fund levy for the $105,000, this is supposed to help with wages and more. 60% of the vote, the, dis, the, the safety levy, which was 51% uh, for elementary school, and it was also, the general fund for high school was also very close, uh, but uh, uh, overwhelmingly they did not, they got about 3,000 more votes against their safety levy, which uh, the elementary schools will be able to get for preventative care. 
Uh, so maybe they will be able to help a lot of the elementary school kids uh, before they get into high school so they won't have to worry so much about preventative care for behavioral health and more. So, um, and then of course, Board of Trustees, uh, Jenny Walsh and Christina Elblin will be new board members for a three-year term. And then as we look into more of the, we further go out, the uh, Lolo School District wanted some more money for a uh, general fund for, of $22,000. Over uh, about uh, two thirds of the people voted against that. They had a couple new members uh, for their Lolo School Board. Potomac also voted against their general fund levy. Um, Woodman School voted, voted against their levy. Bonner, which is very surprising because they've been asking their uh, community for a uh, levy request for their thing. And we're going to use that as a uh, springboard point to talk back a little bit more about this because one of the things about these smaller communities and what the superintendent has spoken before in the past because I've uh, usually done the Bonner uh, Bill and Town, Bonner Milltown Community Council, which talks about things that are happening within their community. Um, you know, the whole idea between this whole additional money for general funds is to help retain a lot of their teachers there because a lot of their teachers have a starting wage about thirteen twenty-five an hour and so they can get more uh, money by working at a local McDonald's than they ever could by working at this school. Uh, smaller schools tend to have these kind of wages and these kind of issues moving forward. They do also have, uh, but with a lot of these smaller communities, especially if they're not connected to bigger metropolitan areas, schools tend to be the only source for a lot of people's incomes while they're living in those smaller communities. So the city of Missoula is looking to cut about 40% of carbon emission from cars by providing updated infrastructure, infrastructure for electric vehicles. So part of the Build Back Better campaign was used to allocate funds for this purpose. And the city of Missoula plans to tap into these federal dollars and so one of the big things about this is that they try to utilize the major corridor between the Highway 93 and also uh, I-90 as the major corridors for many communities and many people who are passing through the city of Missoula as an excuse to be able to grow this system. Uh, the city transportation is uh, converting many of the city buses to electric, which they already have gotten grants related to the infrastructure improvements, but this would be for better charging stations for electrical vehicles. Um, in late 2021, the city landed a $850,000 federal grant to begin the planning for a future of Brook Street, which they convert the roadway to a bus rapid transit system. They also received $39 million grants to construct new maintenance and operation facilities for the transit for a new, uh, uh, technically a whole new bus station. Uh, last month, the city also received $24 million grants to modernize the transport transportation network in downtown Missoula. The National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program provided Montana with $45 million to deploy charging ports along its alternative fuel corridors, with, which includes Interstate 90 and 93. So $45 million for the state of Montana, not to be confused with just the state of Missoula. So Missoula is a hub for major north slash north-south east-west highways, making it, this grant an easy win for those traveling across the northwest and midwest which is in need of infrastructure for this new form of travel. So imagine if you're traveling from Seattle to Chicago, you need to pass through Missoula, and it's a great way to add these additional infrastructure across the state of Montana, and Missoula would be the best place to do it. Um, speaking of money, local uh, area nonprofits managed to raise $1.2 million over the 26 hours last week through Missoula Gives. Through the efforts of over 4,000 individual donors, 200 nonprofit in Missoula, which exceed last year by $100,000, the annual fundraiser was hosted by Missoula Community Foundation and was a rousing success. Their goal was $1.3 million, but so after a long road to get to the Clark Fork River tested, uh, so that was a rousing success. So they were really happy about all the money and a lot of local area nonprofits were able to get uh, some good money throughout this program as well. Um, and so as we go further back, we're going to talk about um, another news item. So I'm going to talk about the Clark Fork River tested pollutants for almost a decade. The Smurfstone Frenchtown meeting had resulted in many issues found in the river. Uh, Trevor Selk, Fish, Wildlife and Parks uh, Pollution Control Biologist, presented water quality results collected by passive water samplers in rivers uh, last summer and found pollution concentration increased near the Smurfstone site. Pollution spikes were also found in other locations. Dioxins, furans, and dioxin-like PCBs were found, which have been known to cause reproductive and developmental problems, damaging the immune system, and cancer in people, fish, and wildlife. The U.S. banned the PCBs uh, um, in 1978 after the toxicity and environmental longevity were discovered. Groundwater and soil samplers taken to Smurfit Stone site, and their site contains more than a million tons of bleached up bleach pulp waste from 39 years of operation. Smurfit Stone was essentially a, um, 
a cardboard facility, but they bleached a lot of their cardboard. So if you ever see those filing white boxes, that's kind of what Smurf at Stone did. Uh, 2013 advisory cautioned people to avoid eating pike from the river below Missoula and limited trout to four meals a month. Four meals a month, crazy, right? The 2019 advisory warned people to avoid uh, all pike and rainbow trout through the Clark Fork River from Bonner to St. Regis. Bonner to St. Regis, don't eat the fish. Uh, the Missoula Current article also covered pollutants out of Butte and Blackfoot Rivers. It is clear that superfluous stone site might be contributing to the dioxides, furans, and PCBs in the Clark Fork. Uh, Selch, uh, the fish wildlife from Park High, also said that the fish tissue data would also provide more information. He hopes to get this information out soon, maybe by the next community advisory group meeting. So those are the kind of things that are happening within our community. Um, I'm going to go to Missoula Current real quick right now to see if there's anything that's um, happening now because just I have uh, a little bit more time. I'm going to look at this. I did have a whole spiel about what's happening in um, I I the whole Israel-Gaza um, uh, war. And um, yeah, there's definitely a lot going on in terms of that. And just a little bit of update, you know, just uh, um, in terms of what's happening is that um, a lot of the uh, major weapons that were passed were on a major pause because of the uh, border being invaded by IDF forces. And President Joe Biden basically saying, like, hey, you know, your invasion with Rafa was a red line you crossed, and we're not going to deal with this right now. We're not going to give you any more funding. And there was a lot of talk even on the IDF side saying this, like, hey, we're going to invade with it, whatever weapons we have, blah, blah, we're not going to listen to you. There's a lot of that going around there as well. And so the U.S. is trying their best to try to mitigate and try to uh, offset that. But there's been a lot of reports of just people dying left and right in those kind of situations. So it's not a really great situation. But, um, but now that we're over at um, uh, Missoula Current, we're going to talk a little bit about a story in terms of, you know, how the Missoula Fire Department is also looking for that uh, additional budget. Chief Gordy Hughes said the department $19 million budget goes primarily to personnel, while the operating budget currently faces a funding shortage. The department is handling a growing number of calls and has struggled in recent years to meet the targeted response. Martin Kidson through the Missoula Current also reports that over the past few months, the department uh, contracted a third party evaluation of its medical service system, along with a fire station location study in hopes of building a sixth fire station in a growing Molin area. Hughes said fire, the rural fire department is doing similar studies as it considers relocating its station to Reserve and South Avenue. Uh, and so the most part, it's, uh, doo -doo -doo. so it's, he also said that $18.7 million of the $19 million in the department operating expenses go to personnel. It represents the department's largest expense, though it does not cover the department need for a fire company. Um, engine costs are 50% over what they were pre-COVID, and they're paying around half a million dollars for type 1 engines, and now they're seeing about $1 million apparatus rolling off the plant, and those aren't even getting to the three years. So uh, a lot of these fire trucks and everything like that, as soon as they buy them, they're pretty much uh, going to be past due after a couple of years, not necessarily how they can't just keep on working through an old infrastructure because it's not up to code based on the national firefighter standards. So the future of a mobile support team may also lie in the fate of their requested fire levy. This uh, city used COVID funding from the American Rescue Plan to act as the program but lacks funding now to cover the many programs ongoing costs. So there's a lot of new programs that were launched during the COVID pandemic that helped a lot of folks along the way. And it seems as though they're, they're gonna have to be a little bit more creative when it comes to a lot of this stuff. But the uh, mobile, uh, so uh, the, th so this is like an ongoing thing. They're gonna be, uh, you're gonna hearing about this quite a bit for quite some time. They're gonna be pleading with this uh, c c uh, city to uh, help pass these levies and everything like that. So this is, an, uh, this is a long campaign that the fire department will be going on and they'll plan on putting this out to the uh, public voters uh, by uh, the November, November ballot, if not sooner for the June ballot. So we'll be looking at that a little bit closer as well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what's happening in our community. You know, if you want to learn more, you can go to MissoulaEvents.net, the Missoula Current. Um, um, Montana Free Press is also a great website for a lot of people who are looking to uh, get some um, local uh, reporters and local news in our community as well. And, uh, and also the Missoula, um, KPAX, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of great news sources. You know, always find more than one, just kind of uh, see how one portrays it as the other and just kind of getting your own uh, um, judgment through that as well. You know, you know now don't just take my word for it. So without further ado, I want to thank you guys for joining me and for Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott Ramph. I hope you have it, guys have a good weekend.